And I speak to you today in the name of our loving, liberating, and life-giving God. Amen. In the course of our lives, we have to change certain behaviors as age and responsibility and situations change. We have to change the habits that shape us because things that worked when we were kids don't necessarily work when we're adults. As, as kids, a lot of things are provided for us. And in adulthood, we realize those dishes aren't going to wash themselves. And so we have to learn new behaviors. And it's a difficult process. For those working in 12-step programs and recovery programs, those suffering from PTSD because of some awful event or because of some deployment that left them in a place that was dangerous and frightening, they too must struggle through, and those steps are even harder. It's so much easier to fall back into the habit, to go back to where you were, to go back to a childish approach to life. The changing of our habits of the heart is hard work and often requires a whole community around us. One of the best ways to change a behavior is to tell somebody that's what you're working on. And in order to do that, you have to share what it was that you did and how it is that you want to go forward. Now, I maintain that the entire book of Exodus is about God working on the behaviors and the expectations of the children of Israel. You'll remember back in the story earlier, Israel, Jacob, had 12 sons. One of them, Joseph, goes to Egypt, gets a high place of authority, and helps both Egypt and his brothers to survive a horrible famine, a five-year famine, a seven-year famine that was all around. He helps them to survive, and he becomes a high official. But over time, as the Exodus begins, we discover there arose a Pharaoh who knew not Joseph. And Israel's sons, those children of Israel, become slaves. They lose their freedom, and Pharaoh no longer sees them as the liberators, the saviors of Egypt, but instead he sees them as a workforce that he can drive as hard as he wants to. Now, we need to think a moment about what slavery entails. In slavery, one does not live in one's own home. One lives in whatever shack your landowner gives you. When one doesn't choose one's own line of work, you do the work in the fields or in construction or whatever it's given. One does not eat one's own food. You get the scraps that fall from Pharaoh's table. One does not wear one's own clothes. Instead, you get whatever's left over in the Egyptian system. Israel had lived in a place of enslavement, and their world was circled by that enslavement, and that was all they knew. But on that moment, when God leads them out of bondage and takes them towards the promised land, they have to find a new way to live. They have to adjust to a whole new way of being. The way the lesson begins today, it actually begins on the second verse of the 16th chapter. The first verse points out that it's been a month since they were liberated, since they came through the Red Sea, since the Egyptian army was decimated and no one is going after them. They've been a month in the wilderness of Sinai. There are no trees in Sinai. There are no plants there's barely anything uh, walking around. It's a desert, it's a wilderness, it's a lost place, and they are hungry. And so the first thing that hungry people do is they murmur. I would that our translators have left murmur in there. Those of you who read these things as children will remember the murmuring of the children of Israel. It says that they, uh, they complained, and complaints are fine. Complaints are what you file with your county commissioner. Complaints are things that you file with paperwork. Murmuring is that which we do all the time. Murmur, murmur, murmur. It's that muttering under your breath. And they murmured about, Ab about Moses and Aaron because, well, who else are you going to murmur about? They were the ones that had led them out of Egypt. They were the ones Moses held out his rod to divide the sea. They murmured against Aaron and Moses because they were the obvious people to murmur about. I remember some murmuring that I did. When, we were, when I was four years old, we lived at Camp Lejeune. 
And my mother wearied of me in the summer. And so at some point she said, go play in the yard. Now, parents of a younger age are going to be mortified to think that's child abuse. I mean, why didn't you just give me my little devices? Well, there wasn't no devices. You went out and played in the yard. I was so incensed that I grabbed a piece of paper and a crayon, the primitive equivalents of my iPad, and I went out, and then I disappeared. Mom said after about five minutes, she looked out in the yard. I was nowhere to be seen. And when she opened the door, inside the green screen door was a piece of paper with murmuring on it. It was four-year-old scribbles. And I apparently looked around from behind a bush and said, I am running away from home, and I'm not coming home until lunch. <laughs> that was my murmuring. Mom was my pharaoh. She had oppressed me. And so I wanted to make everybody know that I was running away until lunch. So the children of Israel are out there and they're beginning to murmur and God responds. Take a minute just to think. These people are out in the wilderness. They think Aaron and Moses are in charge and who responds? God, the most high, the maker of heaven and earth, the one that made everything including the wilderness and the Nile River and the Mediterranean. God responds and says, you'll get bread in the morning and meat at night. You'll get bread in the morning and meat at night. Now, the bread was a little different than the bread they'd eaten in Egypt. There were no wheat fields. There were no rice patties. There was nowhere to get it except for this substance that appeared in the morning. It, it's so peculiar that the Hebrew word is manha, which means, what is it? Manna literally means, what is it? They didn't have any idea. In fact, I can see all the mamas getting together and saying, what are we going to do with this stuff? It's like when you get some lovely gift from someone from a different culture and you have to figure out how to cook it. And so it was that they found out that manna could be the bread that they ate every day. And in the evening, quails miraculously appeared and simply died. And they knew how to roast a quail. And so along the way, bread and meat day after day God fed God's people in a most marvelous way. But God was also constructing a new reality because on the sixth day, they gathered twice as much. On the sixth day, they would go out and get the manna and they had twice as much as they had the day before. On other days, if they gathered too much and tried to hold it over till the morning, it spoiled, Scripture tells us. But on the sixth day, they gathered twice as much and there was no manna to be seen on the seventh day. God was helping God's people to see first, to rely on God for their food, and second, that Sabbath, Shabbat, taking a break, a day of rest, was essential to be God's people. You cannot be God's people if you don't take a day of rest. I'll get back to that in a few minutes. But here we are. God is raining down food from on high. God provides for the people. And Exodus will later tell us that for 40 years wandering in the desert, for six days they would wake up and there was the manna. And six evenings they would go out and there were the quails. They were fed again and again until their heartbeat said, it's the seventh day we have to rest. I was in Jerusalem on a Friday Jerusalem's as busy a city as Annapolis or Baltimore or Washington, D.C. There are people driving around. There are military guys with their, their guns to protect us on the, in the various shops and markets until about 3 o'clock. And then everybody sort of shifts gears. You see people carrying bags of groceries, and then they disappear into their households. In the hotel I was in, at 5 o'clock, the elevators went to stopping on every floor, up and down, up and down. The reason was it was Shabbat. It was Sabbath. It was the day that God said was the day to rest. After a while, the, uh, the bellhop realized that I was a Gentile, and he pointed me around to the Gentile elevator so I could get to the 11th floor without the journey. But it was really fun to do that. Just imagine stopping at every floor going up 11 and every floor coming back down. Sabbath is taken so seriously in Israel that they know this is the time for prayer, for singing, for going to, to the synagogue, for hearing Torah, for being built up. And all of that starts in the desert. Everybody gets to eat the same thing. 
There is no special food for Moses and Aaron, no king's table for the 12 leaders of the 12 tribes. Instead, everybody eats the same thing, which brings me to the gospel lesson. Uh, This afternoon, you might look at that again and go, what the heck is he talking about? People who work one hour get paid the same amount as people who work nine hours in the hot sun? The fact is that that's exactly what Jesus is talking about because he's talking about provision that comes from God, the way in which God's grace is poured out upon us equally and for all. The image is that in God's realm, in God's way, equality is what we are. God sees us all in exactly the same way, rich and poor. God tries to ask us who are rich to remember the poor. God asks the poor to look to their rich friends and say, it's time for some equality in all of this. What happens in the Sinai is that God begins a program of reprogramming. God begins habits that Israel will carry and identify with for the rest of time. Now, many of us live in now a timeless time, and I'm not into blue laws. I don't need to lock up the mall or the grocery store just because it's the Lord's day. But I do think there's something to saying to those who manage you, I need a break. And even if you're not working as an employee, to say to your family and friends, we need to stop for a while and turn off the devices. We need to listen to each other to sing the songs that connect us back to God, that remind us that everything we have is not something that we bought or earned. It is a gift from God. I hope you say the Lord's Prayer every day. I hope if you're around children, you'll you'll let them hear you saying the Lord's Prayer because it's essential teaching of Jesus. Give us this day our daily bread. Not the bread for a future annuity that will come a long time from now. Give us this day our daily bread. That's where God started with God's people as he reprogrammed them to be the holy ones who would go into the holy land and would see that everything that the milk and honey and everything that came in, in the promised land was there by God's gracious gift. So let us seek a place where we can take the break. We can receive the manna. We can eat the quail and laugh and tell stories about the creator who made us all. God helped Israel to see that. May God help us to see it as well. Amen.